Hello, and welcome to Arcadia University's BI 327 Histology course. This is the first of a three-part series of lectures on cartilage. And in part one, we're going to look at the general characteristics associated with cartilage. As with each of these different topics, uh, it's going to be important for you as a student to uh, review the objectives for the lectures. Uh, you can use the objectives as study focusing questions. You can also use this as information that will help you to determine what are the important concepts and information that you need to pull out of uh, these lectures and, and understand for a better understanding of these basic topics. Now, if we take a look at cartilage, what we're looking at is basically a specialized skeletal connective tissue. And so, like other types of connective tissue, it's going to be composed of cells, in this case cartilage cells, with an intervening extracellular matrix, the material that's going to be between these cells. And it's going to be the characteristics of that extracellular matrix that are going to give the cartilage as a tissue its overall characteristics. And it generally is going to be uh, defined as having firmness and resiliency. And so it's got some strength, but it's still a little bit flexible. It's got some uh, advantages associated with it. It's capable of rapid growth, but it still has a lot of support uh, mechanisms in place. Now, when we take a look at cartilage within the human body, its most prominent location is going to be within the fetal skeleton. Uh, within the fetal skeleton, we're looking at very rapid growth of the body, uh, but we still need to have support of the body, we need to have protective structures for those internal organs, so we need to have the skeletal components. But because it needs to be growing rapidly, we need to have a mechanism in place, a tissue in place, that can grow very, very quickly in response to the growth of the body, or at least the, the rate of growth that the body needs at that point. Now, in general, what we're going to see is that most of the skeleton is going to be replaced by bone with later development, into childhood, into adulthood, we're going to see that that fetal skeleton is going to be converted into a bony skeleton. But it's important to recognize that our there are going to be some locations within the body, uh, the tips of the, the long bones and the joint cavities, uh, the, the nose, the trachea, the ears, where we're going to see cartilage persisting. And generally, it's going to persist within the adult where those mechanical properties, where that function, in essence, is needed. And so we're going to see cartilage in various locations within the adult human being. Now again, when we take a look at cartilage, the first thing to recognize is that cartilage is going to be a connective tissue. It's a specialized connective tissue, but it's still going to have the same overall characteristics of our generic connective tissue. So we're going to have cells. These cells are going to be scattered away from one another, uh, like we see in other connective tissues. But in this case, the cells can be referred to as chondrocytes. Chondro for cartilage, site for cells. So these cartilage cells, these chondrocytes, are going to be scattered throughout the cartilage, uh, the cartilage as a tissue. And then in between that, we're going to have that intervening extracellular matrix, that stuff that's outside of the cells. And the extracellular matrix is going to be the predominant tissue component within the cartilage uh, uh, structure. Now it's important to recognize that the matrix is going to be avascular. We're not going to have blood vessels that are going to penetrate into the cartilage tissue. So what that means then is that we need to have the ability for diffusion into the cartilage for the delivery of oxygen, nutrients, metabolites, other things, as well as the diffusion of waste materials out of that tissue. Now, again, because of the characteristics of the extracellular matrix, we've got a lot of water in that region. We've got uh, some resiliency associated with it so that you can compress the cartilage, squeeze the water out a little bit, but like a sponge, when you remove the pressure, it's going to go back to its normal size and shape and draw the water back in. And the presence of lots of this water is going to facilitate the diffusion materials both into and out of the cartilage tissue. If we take a look at the components of the extracellular matrix, like other types of connective tissue, we're going to have fibers and ground substance. Now in, car in, in collagen, the fibers, I'm sorry, in cartilage, the fibers are going to be type 1, I'm sorry, yeah, type 2 collagen. We had type 1 collagen, those thick collagen bundles in traditional uh, generic connective tissues like your tendons, like the, the loose connective tissue underneath an epithelia. In cartilage, what we're going to have is type 2 collagen, a much finer collagen molecule, a finer collagen matrix. Still got some strength, but it has different characteristics than the type 1 collagen and the other connective tissues. So type 2 collagen is going to be 
uh, a characteristic identifying factor within both hyaline cartilage and elastic cartilage, the two types of cartilage, the first two types that we're going to be talking about uh, within this course. So that's an identifying characteristic. So we got some fibers. We're also going to have ground substance, very abundant ground substance, and it's basically going to be the predominant component within cartilage as a tissue. And again, the characteristics of these uh, proteoglycans, uh, glycosaminoglycans, uh, are going to draw a lot of water into the region, give it some firmness, give it some strength, but it's still kind of gel-like. It can be compressed and rebound, uh, at least at limited levels. And again, promoting diffusion of um, materials back and forth, as well as giving cartilage its overall uh, characteristics and properties. If we take a look at the chondrocytes, again, the cartilage cells, what we're going to see is that they tend to be round cells, uh, maybe slightly oval cells, with an eccentric nucleus. This nucleus isn't usually centrally located. It's going to be pushed off to the side. The nucleus is going to have a prominent nucleolus, and then when we take a look at the cytoplasm, we're going to have a basophilic cytoplasm, a well-developed rough endoplasmic reticulum, and a Golgi apparatus. So if we look at these characteristics, a prominent nucleolus, well-developed rough endoplasmic reticulum, or Golgi apparatus, what we see is going to be classic of a cell that is involved with synthesis and secretion of proteins. And again, the chondrocytes are going to be doing that because they're going to be involved with the synthesis and secretion of the materials within the extracellular matrix. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the chondrocytes are going to be embedded throughout the cartilage tissue. And we know that the cartilage is going to be avascular. We're not going to have blood vessels coming in. So it's going to be the chondrocytes are going to be dependent upon diffusion for the delivery of oxygen, the delivery of metabolites, the delivery of glucose, uh, the diffusion of waste materials out of it. All of that's going to have to be occurring by diffusion. And so what we're going to see is that these chondrocytes are going to be using anaerobic glycolysis. It's not as efficient a mechanism as aerobic glycolysis and aerobic cellular respiration, but it's going to allow this cell to be able to produce enough ATP to do what it needs to do. But again, it's going to have a very limited metabolism. And again, that's a characteristic of the cartilage tissue. If we look surrounding the cartilage tissue, we're going to have a perichondrium, a peri for around, chondri for cartilage. So we're looking at a region around the cartilage. The perichondrium is basically going to be a dense connective tissue, which is going to be surrounding the cartilage and helping to connect the cartilage to the surrounding tissues and organs. Uh, within the perichondrium, we're going to have a very rich vascular supply, so larger blood vessels coming in, as well as many, many capillaries within this region. Because again, the capillaries, the blood supply, are going to stay within the perichondrium, and materials are going to diffuse into the cartilage from the perichondrium, from those blood vessels into it, and then waste materials from the cartilage into the perichondrium and then be picked up by these capillaries and transported away. If we look in finer detail at the perichondrium, we're going to see that there's two basic layers within the perichondrium. There's going to be an outer, what's referred to as fibrous layer, and within this outer fibrous layer, we're essentially going to have that integration of the structure of the cartilage into the surrounding tissues, anchoring it to the surrounding tissues. So what we're going to have is more traditional connective tissue components. We're going to have things like fibroblasts. We're going to have things like type 1 collagen fibers. And again, this is going to anchor the cartilage into the surrounding tissues. Inner to that, kind of right up against that outer surface of the cartilage tissue itself, is going to be the chondrogenic layer of the perichondrium. This inner layer is essentially going to be composed of chondrocyte stem cells. Chondrocyte, again, cartilage cell stem cells, are going to be relatively undifferentiated, but in response to a proper signal, these cells are going to be recruited, they're going to differentiate, they're going to become specialized to become chondrocytes, to become cartilage cells. So they're going to be involved with the production and deposition of cartilage along that external surface of that uh, cartilage mass. Now, that's going to finish up uh, the first lecture, first mini lecture on this series, uh, giving us a general overview of the characteristics associated with cartilage. Uh, the next lecture, we're going to take a look at hyaline cartilage, and then in the following lecture, we're going to look at fibrocartilage and elastic cartilage. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture.